Turkey blames ISIS for a deadly terror attack. People were shooting on one side, and we all ran the other way, and then the bombs went off. What we're learning about the shootings, the explosions, and the aftermath. The U.S., Canada, and Mexico. President Obama meets with North American leaders. Special Mass at the Vatican. We take you to the celebration of the Solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul. And political wrestling over health care. How the U.S. responds to the Zika virus threat. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 29th, 2016. Deadly explosions caught on camera. Suicide bombers target Istanbul's Ataturk Airport, killing 41 people and injuring hundreds. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Tonight, witnesses describe the terror as world leaders, including Pope Francis, react. The airport, the scene of the attack, reopens less than 24 hours later. Passengers arrive near the spot where dozens of people died. This airport has 284 flight destinations of 113 countries. This is not Turkey's airport, it's the world's airport. But it's not business as usual. Images of the attack are hard to forget. Surveillance cameras captured one of the three suicide bombers running through the hallway, then falling to the ground, his gun flying. People around him start to run away, then his bomb explodes into a fireball. We saw a lot of people running around. They were all covered in blood. Turkey's government blames ISIS, but it's too early in the investigation to know for sure. We do know the bombers arrived in a taxi. Two were at the international terminal, one stayed in the parking area. And I saw actually one of the suicide killers uh, blew himself up. And Wyatt Goolsby continues our team coverage tonight from the Turkish embassy here in Washington. He has reaction from Americans who survived the attack. Wyatt? Brian, the Turkish embassy conveying their condolences to all those who lost family and friends in the attack. This has been a difficult day for Turks and for Turkish Americans. Many visitors dropping off flowers here at the uh, Turkish embassy. The prime minister has declared this a day of mourning for his country. Hundreds of relatives, friends and mourners in Istanbul offer prayers during the funeral of one of the victims of the airport attack. Authorities were able to identify the 25-year-old deceased as one of the airport's ground service workers. But many are still waiting for word about their loved ones. During the day, relatives lined up outside this morgue to hear if their family member had been identified. Some, like this man, were visibly upset, saying a Muslim man in Ramadan, the holy month of fasting, shouldn't kill anyone. Turkish Airlines passengers arriving in Houston, Texas, were relieved after leaving Istanbul just before the shooting started. Those last two hours seemed like forever, but we're glad we're home and we're safe. It was scary to know because, like, watching the videos, we were in that gate. We were there just waiting for our flight. If you're constantly living in fear about everything, then that's exactly what they want. Back in Turkey, Thomas Kemper, an American, says he's thankful to be alive. Kemper recounts hearing the blast, then running from the attackers. And I was in the Turkish Airlines lounge and, and just taking a nap, actually. And then uh, the blast woke me up and was very, very close. And then the gunfire and the shooting. And, and uh, first you think that you're on a film, you know, but then people started running and I just ran with them. I grabbed my stuff and ran. But then other people came towards us, so it was a total chaos. And then we all started to hide. Kemper says he was so scared he hid until it was all over. He said the attack reminded him of the images he saw from Paris and Orlando. Today, the Turkish prime minister told his people that terrorism is a global threat, and that's why they need to unite and work with other countries. Just this year, Turkey has suffered a number of terrorist attacks in major cities. Brian. Wyatt Goolsby at the Turkish embassy. Thank you, Wyatt. Pope Francis asks pilgrims and tourists in St. Peter's Square today to pray for the people of Turkey. Sulla via della pace, preghiamo tutti in silenzio. Pope Francis saying, may the Lord convert the hearts of the violent and support our feet on the path to peace. He then asked for silent prayer for the people of Turkey, the Vatican celebrating Rome's patrons, Saints Peter and Paul today. We have more on today's solemnity coming up, but first, more fallout from the terror attack in Turkey. The issue surfaced during President Obama's trip to Canada today, 
Our chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn has more. Lauren? Brian, President Obama is attending the North American Leaders Summit in Ottawa. The leaders of Canada and Mexico joined him to reaffirm their close partnership during a time of rising extremist threats and isolationist calls in the presidential campaign. The prayers of the American people are with the people of Turkey, the people of Istanbul, uh, and all those who were affected by this terrible crime. The three leaders of a total of 480 million people came together to discuss security, the environment, and trade, just one day after the terrorist attack in Turkey. This is part of our broader shared fight against terrorist networks, and we will continue to work closely with Turkey to root them out. The attack sent ripples through the presidential campaign as well. Hillary Clinton says the bombings are, quote, a reminder that the United States cannot retreat. We need to deepen our cooperation with allies in the Middle East and Europe to take on this threat and keep our community safe. Donald Trump tweeted, yet another terrorist attack. So sad. It's bad. And we better get smart and we better get tough. But we're not going to have much of a country left. Trump's ability to manage foreign policy is the focus of a new Pew Research Center poll. It shows Trump's ratings in the single digits in seven of 15 countries polled. His Democratic rival, Hillary Clinton, fares much better. Another poll by Quinnipiac University shows Clinton with a two-point lead in the general election over her Republican rival. Even with third-party candidates added to the mix, Clinton holds that two-point lead. A Washington Post-ABC News poll, along with the Wall Street Journal and BC News poll, both show Clinton significantly ahead of Trump. Brian? Thank you. Lauren Ashburn at the White House. Blaise Mishtal, director of the National Security Program at the Bipartisan Policy Center, is with us. How could this attack happen at one of the world's most secure airports, Blaze? Well, I think it's important to note that this attack didn't really happen in the airport. If you think back to the Brussels attack, that didn't happen inside the secure perimeter. It happened sort of at the ticketing counter. This happened even further outside the airport perimeter. So we have sort of mixed reports about where it happened, but it happened either at the doors where people enter, and there's actually, this is an airport I know well, I've flown in and out a lot. There's actually a security checkpoint when you walk in the door just to get to the ticketing counter. So it either happened right there or one level down where people are waiting for taxis where there's less security and in the parking garage. So it was really just outside the airport that this happened. And obviously that's a lot harder to secure. So why does Turkey seem to be under increasing attack? Well, the simple answer is it is right on the border of one of the massive wars that's going on in Syria and Iraq, where you have not only ISIS fighting, but a whole number of extremist groups. Uh, but the more complicated answer is they've been using Turkey as an access point to that war for the past five years. And for a long time, Turkey has allowed that to happen for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which is that Turkey primarily in Syria wants to get rid of uh, Assad, and it has used its relationship with extremist groups like al-Nusra and has tolerated others like ISIS to try to further that goal. Uh, and so we've really seen Turkey sort of be a little negligent in going after the terrorist groups that are now targeting it. It seems like we have an attack somewhere in the world almost every week. Is this part of a, a strategy to instill global fear? It certainly is, and I think uh, we don't know what happened in Turkey yet. My guess is it's a little different than what we saw happen in Orlando, for example, where we had a lone wolf actor who was radicalized but not directed by ISIS Central. I think it's likely that what we saw in Turkey was directed by ISIS itself for a number of reasons. Uh, yesterday was the second anniversary of the announcement of the caliphate. Uh, Turkey just signed a, a deal with Israel restoring diplomatic relations, which, which could have angered uh, ISIS and Turkey has been increasingly active in the fight against ISIS and allowing the U.S. to use its air bases, which could also anger ISIS. All right, excellent expert analysis from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Blaise Mishtal, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. And other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. The U.S. Senate shoots down funding to fight the Zika virus, partly due to a controversy over Planned Parenthood. Jason Calvey reports from Capitol Hill. Jason? Brian, the money would help research a vaccine as well as kill the mosquitoes that carry Zika. The U.S. has had 800 cases, including 300 pregnant women. The $1.1 billion in funding lies in legislative limbo after a mostly party-line vote. The motion is not agreed to. 
With a Zika deal now on hold, Republicans. I, I, I don't quite get it. I mean, this is this is playing politics with a very serious issue. And Democrats blame each other. It's the last thing that Republicans should be playing politics with. Democrats slammed Republicans for not including funding for groups like Planned Parenthood. In particular, $95 million to provide services like birth control to women in Puerto Rico. And to somehow reduce the funding for contraception and reduce funding for women's health uh, is actually goes in absolutely the wrong direction for, for us in this country. My understanding is there was just no earmarks for Planned Parenthood, but there was no language that specifically denied them funding. Is that correct? I've answered your question. Thank, okay, you. thank you. But Republicans fired back. There is no mention of Planned Parenthood in this conference report. Community health centers can do that work, hospitals can do that work, clinics can do that work. Uh, because Planned Parenthood wasn't specifically listed as one of the places to do the work, they suddenly said that we're shooting down Planned Parenthood on it. Planned Parenthood's not going to be the expert, it's not going to be the location uh, that's the best bet for that anyway. And so I think their, their direction to say we want to make sure Planned Parenthood gets a piece of the Zika funding doesn't make sense. Zika is also linked with birth defects, but a top leader at the CDC tells News Nightly they're still researching. The best information we have right now um, suggests that infection in the first trimester might lead to a 1 to 15 percent risk of a, of a harmful outcome for the baby. Um, that's very preliminary and of course that still means that the majority of women would have healthy babies. Senators of both parties say they hope the other rethinks their vote during the July 4th recess. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says one of the problems of being the minority party here, the Democrats, is that you don't exactly get what you want. And Brian, even if the Senate does pass this when they vote on it again, the White House has promised a veto. Thanks, Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. And Vice President Joe Biden threatens to pull federal funding for cancer studies that don't publicly share their results. He is pressuring researchers, doctors, even drug companies. He believes shared information will help find cures sooner. Think of how many people you know who are saying, you docs, who are saying, doc, I just want to make it one more month to see my daughter get married. Doc, all I want to do is see my, my daughter graduate. Time matters. Days matter. Minutes matter. Biden's so-called cancer moonshot is motivated by the death of his son, Beau, recently from brain cancer. This week's Supreme Court decision overturning a Texas pro-life law is called by some a win for women. One Catholic woman says that attitude perpetuates a lie. Legal and Catholic scholar Erica Bakiaki, a visiting fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, is visiting us today. So it's assumed that this court championed women with this decision. What is wrong with that assumption? Well, there's a whole bunch uh, wrong with the assumption that abortion ever champions women or ever helps women. In this case, what we have is uh, abortion clinics and abortion doctors thinking that they're acting on behalf of women, when in fact they have interests that are directly opposed to women in the sense that they are running clinics uh, that you know need to pay the bills and in fact are making lots of money um, taking the lives of, of unborn children. So in fact, their interests are directly opposed to the women's interests, especially with regard to health and safety. What do you mean with the statement that abortion distortion is very clear in this case? Yeah, so it's interesting. We've been talking about the abortion distortion uh, in constitutional law and in uh, legislative, um, you know, certainly uh, looking at court appointments, Supreme Court appointments and that type of thing, how abortion has really distorted the Constitution um, because there's certainly no abortion in the Constitution. They've sort of made it all up. But in, in this case, what's fascinating, as in Roe, and that's what I do in a, in a piece I wrote for SCOTUS blog is compare the two cases, um, that there's this sort of hopping over, skipping over, in fact, even changing civil procedure. So basic procedures and safeguards that are meant to help litigants go through you know, a, ca a case. They've just skipped over all of it in order to get to the, the substantive issue of abortion. And so they've done the law in general, sort of an, an injustice, um, in order to just decide on, a, on abortion. It makes sense. Uh, well, not really, but the way you put it. <laughs> How did abortion come to be thought of as a human right with complete disregard for the child? Yeah, it's amazing how abortion has really been elevated. I mean, if you think about the sexual revolution, it's really at the centerpiece of the sexual revolution. And so, you know, I think of uh, the, the, the sort of bigger, badder new, worse news out of the Supreme Court, I think, if you can imagine, um, than this abortion case is the fact that 
The Supreme Court has denied certiorari, which means they will not take a case in Washington state in which pharmacists have been told by a, a, an administrative pharmaceutical board that they must provide Plan B. This is a mom and pop pharmacy, and they've been told that they have to provide Plan B. An abortion inducing drug. That's right. And so there are pharmacies all around. Within five minutes, there are uh, five miles, there are pharmacies all around where they could go and refer patients, which they do all the time, to say, go and get the drug elsewhere. We don't stock it. But they've said, no, we are going to violate your conscience. And, and this is a First Amendment right, yeah, right? More Our distortion. first right, more yeah. distortion. From the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Erica Bakiaki, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Coming up, a new archbishop provides a fresh start for Catholics in Cuba and protecting women's health. Pro-life concerns over this week's Supreme Court ruling. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday evening, June 29th, the Solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul. The Breakaway Traditionalist Society of St. Pius X accuses Pope Francis of spreading confusion and errors about the faith. A statement released by the Society today suggests that a new attempt at reconciliation with Rome has stalled. This group, founded in 1969, opposes Vatican II reforms, including the celebration of Mass in the vernacular and outreach to Jews and other Christians. Havana's new Archbishop Juan de la Caridad Garcia is expected to bring fresh hope to the Cuban Catholic Church. His supporters say, unlike his diplomatic predecessor, Cardinal Jaime Ortega, Garcia focuses on the church's relationship with ordinary Cubans. The Cuban Conference of Catholic Bishops highlights Garcia's simplicity of life. One recent Sunday, he left Havana's Grand Cathedral to celebrate Mass at a small parish church. Only one American was among the 25 new Metropolitan Archbishops to receive the pallium from Pope Francis today. Archbishop Bernard Hebda oversees the Diocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis. The pallium is a white wool vestment worn over the shoulders, symbolizing authority as well as unity with the Holy See. It is presented each year, June 29th, to new Metropolitan Archbishops appointed throughout the previous year. Well, as the High Court struck down Texas's pro-life law this week, Pro-lifers outside the court chanted, Gosnell, Gosnell. That is the name of the Philadelphia abortionist convicted of murdering three babies born alive in his so-called clinic. The documentary 3801 Lancaster, the address of Gosnell's office, features exclusive interviews with Gosnell and some of his patients. They gave me the IV and whatever they gave me, it burnt so bad, but I could feel like the medicine traveling like to my chest. And I like screamed like ah, cause like I had the worst chest pain ever. I felt like my heart, my heart was on fire. And I sat up, and all I remember is they pushed me back down. David Altrogi, director of 3801 Lancaster, American Tragedy, joining us by Skype from Pittsburgh. David, how was Kermit Gosnell's Pennsylvania clinic, now called the House of Horrors, able to get so bad over those years? Well, you know, the grand jury report makes it very clear that um, it was able to get so bad because the Pennsylvania Department of State and Pennsylvania Department of Health simply chose not to respond to complaints of, of wrongdoing uh, and unsafe conditions. Now, you had unprecedented interview access with Gosnell himself. How does he defend his actions? Well, essentially, uh, it boils down to he says he was doing a service uh, to the impoverished community of West Philadelphia. Um, and he says in his defense that the, the uh, babies um, were not born alive. Um, that's his defense, um, despite what the, the evidence that was brought forth in the trial uh, and in the investigation. Now, after his conviction, Texas passed laws trying to guard against repeating history. Do you believe, based on what you've seen in your investigation, could state regulations have made a difference there in Philadelphia? Listen, absolutely. Uh, one of the women who died at Gosnell's clinic, uh, Karnamaya Monger, one of the contributing factors to her death was the fact that the, the EMT simply couldn't get a gurney uh, through the hallways. It wasn't, it wasn't up to surgical, uh, a medical uh, surgical, outpatient surgical center. Um, and her life, uh, something could have been saved had they been able to get in there in a timely manner. Now, you interviewed some of Gosnell's patients. Based on what they told you, would they support abortion health regulations that, like those that were struck down by the Supreme Court this week? Listen, one of the patients we, we interviewed and who was in the film extensively, she's pro-choice and she was very in favor of 
regulations like this because she doesn't want to see what happened to her happen to women in, in states like Texas and in Pennsylvania. Having been so close to this, do you have any thoughts as to why this decision was made? One of the justices said, basically, if this was an abortion, these would have been approved immediately. I, I think it is the the fact that it's an abortion. It's an abortion case. Um, the, the the grand jury report for the Gosnell case makes it very clear that um, you know they just didn't want to touch the abortion issue here in Pennsylvania, and that's why Gosnell was allowed to do what he did for so long. And I think the same could be said uh, of the Supreme Court that it's just you know if we put any regulations, we're afraid that it's somehow going to inhibit women's access to abortion. But as the Gosnell case showed, it only goes to hurt women. It's difficult to watch, but certainly a fascinating film. 3801 Lancaster, American Tragedy. The director, David Altrogi, joining us from Pittsburgh. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Up next, The Beauty of Faith, how art portrays Saints Peter and Paul. And Solemnity of the Saints, we take you to today's Mass at St. Peter's Basilica. Thank you for joining us this evening as we look at the beauty of faith. I'm Brian Patrick. Dr. Jim Sullivan, former guide at the National Gallery of Art, is the author of The Beauty of Faith. And on this feast of Saints Peter and Paul, tell us about an engraving of these two martyrs holding an image of Jesus crucified. St. Peter and St. Paul have been remembered in the church's calendar together uh, since very early on. And tradition also holds that both men were martyred for their faith in and around Rome. This rare 16th century engraving from the National Gallery of Art shows them holding what is considered to be uh, arguably the most venerated, important relic of the Middle Ages, a piece of cloth with the face of Jesus uh, with a crown of thorns on his head. Uh, this is the true image or vera icon uh, that was discovered in Rome around 1200 and became very much a part of devotion uh, and the church's life. And um, the name Veronica was given to the woman, and it's a play on Vera icon, true image. Uh, the name Veronica was given to the woman who is believed to have received this miraculous image as she wiped the face of Jesus on his way to Calvary. So here, St. Peter and St. Paul are contemplating the image of Jesus, the true image of Jesus in his sufferings as they prepare for their own sufferings and martyrdom for their faith in Jesus. And as we pray the stations, we come to Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. In this 15th century painting, it features Our Lady and the Child Jesus with these two apostles. This beautiful panel from the National Gallery of Art was completed around 1430 in Siena by the artist Domenico di Bartolo. And uh, at the center of the composition is Mary with the child Jesus. They're enthroned uh, with a host of angels above them. Mary is clothed in beautiful robes of blue and red colors that signify the divinity and humanity of her son Jesus. Um, and St. Peter on the right with the key, symbol of his authority over the apostles and the church that is entrusted to him by Jesus. And St. Paul on the left with uh, the book of the Gospels and the sword, perhaps an allusion to his letter to the Ephesians when he speaks of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So I think this image is a beautiful reminder of how Jesus was really at the center of the life and mission of these two apostles. Saints Peter, Peter and Paul, pray for us. The author of The Beauty of Faith, Dr. Jem Sullivan. Thank you for being with us, Jem. Thank you. And for the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick, and we're going to leave you tonight looking back at today's celebration at the Vatican. Pope Francis says, Saints Peter and Paul set the example of leading people from division to unity. He says the church must see, quote, the small openings through which God can work and move from sadness to joy. Saints Peter and Paul, pray for us.